So, good evening everyone. Uh, I'm here just for the introduction of our two panelists. Uh, my name is Daniel Martinovic and from, on behalf of Center for Civil Courage, uh, Center of the Grajansko Harabas, it's a really a great pleasure to introduce our two guests tonight that have come here all the way, well, you're living in Croatia, so he lives in But they both, at some point in their lives, came from England here. And we have Lloyd Evans and Alex O'Connor who will be talking this evening with us. Uh, first, Lloyd will uh, talk something about the cult that he is now free from and living his life fully. And, every, and Alex will talk about how religion is, well, overrated. To, to stop that right there. Uh, also, uh, yes. And also, Lloyd told me to plug his book, which costs like 2,000 million kunas or 170 kunas. And it's a, a really a light read, just 700 pages. So if you are interested later, well, did, did you make this whole event just to sell your book and promote? No, I would never do something like that. You would never like do that. such a thing. Okay, no. okay. So anyhow, uh, it's a, it's also really a great pleasure to see so many people here. I hope you are all here by choice and not by chance. And without further ado, so Lloyd uh, will start with his part, then Alex, and then afterwards we will have a short question and answer. So if you have any questions for our panelists or you do want to contribute to the discussion, just raise your hand and in five words or less you can make a question. So that's okay. Thank you. So, you Thank, you. Thank you. Sorry so much. Very sorry about the, uh, the delay. We'll get going. I'm going to blame it all on Alex. Can I just see by a show of hands who's here for the event? Just so we can... That's really nice. Thank you so much for coming. That's really good. So my, my talk, my theme that I've given myself is why almost anyone can get stuck in a cult. Now, before I begin, I just want to say... Dobro večer. Hvala što ste došli. Ispriča vam se što ću govoriti na engleskom. Iako živim ovdje već dosta godine, ne govorim tečno na hrvatskom. So my theme, again, why almost anyone can get stuck in a cult. So why did I say almost? Well, I think it would be unfair to say that anyone can get stuck in a cult because I think that there are lots of people probably here today who probably have what it takes to steer clear of cults for the rest of their lives. But as I'm going to explain, it isn't the same for everybody and there are conditions in which you could find yourself stuck in a cult. And I also say why anyone could get stuck in a cult. And I accept that in saying that, my story is not going to be the same as your stories. In fact, my story is fairly unique. Although it, it's not the only one of its kind. There are many people who will be watching this video who have had a similar story to mine. So what is my story? Well, I was raised in England as a Jehovah's Witness. I was raised to believe that Armageddon would be coming any moment. I want to say any moment. We were trained one night as part of a family training exercise. We were made to believe that Armageddon was here now and we had to run in and get our belongings. We had to pack our belongings into our bags, believing that Armageddon was coming. And only at the last minute did my father say to me, actually, I was just joking but I did want to see how you would respond. That seriously, my family took Armageddon. That's how I was raised to think of Armageddon. It's coming any moment. And you know what? It's gonna kill anybody who is not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's, I think, something about Jehovah's Witnesses that I don't think people understand. It's not just about reading the Bible and serving God. and It's actually about avoiding annihilation. So fast forward, I'm 21 years old, my mother's just died from cancer and the doubts that I was starting to have about my faith got put on hold because when someone you love dies and you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, 
it's a case of, you know what, if you want to see your mother again, guess what, you need to be as good a Jehovah's Witness as you possibly can be. So I put all of my doubts on hold, and I threw myself into being the best Jehovah's Witness I could possibly be. And then, when I was 29, through a series of events that I won't bore you with, I ended up moving to Croatia. <laughs> because my wife is Croatian, and we wanted to be near her parents. But it was only when I started to go into, go into witness meetings, and you have to go to two meetings a week if you're a Jehovah's Witness. It was only through going to those meetings and not understanding the language that I was able to think, hang on, hold on a minute, what do I really think? What do I really believe? And then I realized that actually I, I didn't really believe any of it. I was there because I was basically being threatened. So that's my story in a nutshell. It's all, it's all explained in my book. Yeah. Um, but that's my story. Now, what's relevant to you about my story? Because obviously I'm guessing that probably the majority, if not all of you, haven't been raised as Jehovah's Witnesses or you haven't been raised to believe that Armageddon is coming any moment. Well, what's relevant about me is that I like to think I'm reasonably intelligent. I think, especially if some of you have come from the philosophy faculty where we posted some posters, probably you guys are far more intelligent than I am. But I'm average intelligence. I'm reasonably well educated. I finished high school with good grades. I did two years at college. And above all, I don't like being lied to. And I like to think that that applies to most, if not all of you. Nobody likes being lied to. So in that sense, my story is the same as everyone's. The only difference is I was successfully deceived. And that's why I feel cults are such a threat, because they use deception. Deception is their main weapon that they use to control minds. We've all seen what's happened in America recently. All it takes is a charismatic leader who comes along and says, hey, I know you're frightened, I know you're scared, I know you're frustrated with what's happening, but I've got all the answers. All you need to do is put your trust in me. Look how easily people buy into that. Look at North Korea. Look at how an entire country can be the private plaything of a regime and they can be held through fear, through having the information stifled, they can be held in utter control. That's how easy it is to be deceived nowadays, that's how easy it is to be controlled. So, I guess I better move on because I want Alex to talk as well. You might be thinking, that's all very well, but it's never gonna happen to me. I'm never gonna get conned by a cult. The simple truth is you don't have clairvoyance, you don't know what your life has in store for you. When my mother joined Jehovah's Witnesses, it was because her husband had died in a fire. And she, as a traumatized widow, along come Jehovah's Witnesses who say, well, don't worry about that. We can promise you an eternal future where death is no more. On, my, on the other side of my family, my grandmother was, had, had just lost both of her parents. Knock, knock, knock on the door. Guess what? We've got a paradise where no one's ever going to die again. When people are crippled by emotion or consumed by grief or fear, they become vulnerable. And you just don't know whether you will ever, through a twist of fate, find yourself in a situation where you become emotionally vulnerable and suddenly someone comes along with all the answers. So that's just my kind of word of caution. I'm hoping that I can talk more about it by answering questions later, but I want to introduce a remarkable young man named Alex O'Connor, <laughs> who is going to talk a little bit about why religion is overrated. Thank you very much. No one can see that I'm telling you how to say Dobre Vecce. Dobre Vecce. <laughs> um, and thus commenced, uh, thus is the end of my Croatian attempt. I'm not even going to try to embarrass myself by pronouncing anything in Croatian. Um, thank you all so much for, for coming out. I'm very sorry about the delays that we've been having. 
Um, it's, it's been nice that I've been able to speak to a few of you uh, in the meantime. Uh, the majority of people here, I, I, I presume, are somewhat agreeable to, to my position. The people I've spoken to already are anyway. Um, if there are any people who know that they're going to disagree with things that we have to say who are lurking among you, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, secondly, you know, I'm not going to be making attempts at sensitive diplomacy here. I, I don't just uh, say what I have to say despite the fact that you might not like it. Oftentimes I'll say what I have to say because of the fact that you don't like it. Um, and that's, that's what I, I, I generally do. If you uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, um, which I hope you will do or are planning on doing, um, you'll know that I, I have some choice words for religion. But as much as I can talk, uh, especially in a country like this, about why religion is, is, is bad, it often falls on deaf ears because that's not the key point as far as I'm concerned. One of, the, one of the things that's overlooked is not just that religion is bad, but that despite the fact that it's bad, many people revere it and think it to be the greatest thing uh, on planet Earth. This is why I think it's not just bad, but overrated. Um, and the main problem that I see in general, and I'm trying to speak quite generally here about religion, um, the main thing, because you, you can speak about the specificities of different religions, but the one thing that seems to bind them all uh, to, to be able to be in a position to say that I know the answers, which is effectively what a, a, a functioning religion needs to do, is a problem of ignorance. But it's not a problem of having ignorance, because we all have ignorance. If you asked me to explain uh, the mechanics of how a car works, I would plead ignorance immediately. And I do so without shame as well. There's nothing wrong with being ignorant. That's not the problem. The problem is not recognizing the ignorance. The problem is having the ignorance, but thinking that you don't. This is, this is the problem. Because religion is the only enterprise that I can think of that simultaneously manages to keep you completely in the dark about reality and tell you things that are complete falsities, but at the same time manages to convince you that you have all the answers. You know, find me the institution that manages to do that so successfully. There's nothing wrong with ignorance. Science, the scientific method, is built upon ignorance. It's necessary. As the circle of knowledge grows, the perimeter outside, the, the, the frontier of knowledge is driven by ignorance, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's something, there's this majesty in, in recognizing uh, our ignorance. But religion can't do this, because as soon as its people begin to wake up and they realize that there are answers that can't be known, then it takes the wind out of the sails of their God, because their God is no longer more powerful. And so it needs to say, we have every answer. And this is how it gets you twice. Because firstly, it will take questions that are unanswerable, or not worth answering. Certain questions like, what, are, what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? These questions might be meaningless. There's two things that religion does, and the first is that it convinces you that these questions are worth answering. And that's bad enough if it wasn't for it then going on to giving you the wrong answer anyway. That's the main problem. And the people who have these answers, because they're told them from childhood, they're told uh, exactly the kind of uh, theology that they need to employ to defend their religious beliefs. Whereas they don't actually understand what they're saying. They're told this tripe about um, sacrifice and vicarious redemption that they don't actually understand, but they learn how to parrot it and say it over and over again. But you ask them a question, and you'll realize that they don't actually understand what they're saying, and they haven't considered the, the underlying effect. Um, it, it, somewhat, it, it reminds me of um, an old story, it may be true, maybe not, of Albert Einstein, when he, uh, when he used to be a touring uh, professor in, in universities up and down his country. Um, he, he would be driven to every single one of his events by his, his driver, his chauffeur. And his, his driver used to say to him at, at one point, he said, you know, Einstein, I've, I've heard you deliver this lecture so many times across this entire uh, country of ours. I've heard it so many times. I think that I could deliver your lecture because I've heard it so many times I could do it from memory. And one night, Einstein is, is very tired and he thinks, you know what, I'll, I'll take you off on that. So he says to his chauffeur, he says, well, I'll tell you what, you go and give the lecture then so I can have a day off. So the chauffeur gets on stage and and delivers this lecture impeccably about general relativity. And everybody is absolutely amazed. And he's taking his bows, he's about to walk off stage. Um, when the moderator says, and now we're going to open the floor for one person to ask a question. 
and the driver freezes, doesn't know what to do. The question comes, puts his hand up and says, what do you think, Professor, is the relationship between relativity and quantum physics? And he thinks. And then he says, you know, that question is so simple, so elementary, because he's been introduced as, as the professor, and Einstein's been introduced as the driver. Um, he says, that question is so simple that I'm going to get my chauffeur to come up and answer it for me. The difference is, of course, that whilst the chauffeur has fooled the audience, the religious only fool themselves because they think they know what they're talking about. But the moment that you're willing to dig down and question them on something, you'll realize that they, they don't know, and they, and they can't know. And uh, this is why science has been so impeded um, by religion, because there's this, there's this obsession with having an answer to everything. And if there's something that they don't know, uh, they, they just, it can't survive. The one way to bring religion to its knees would be for its people to recognize their ignorance. And I'm not talking about the kind of ignorance that says, I don't know the answer that someone does, or that God does. That's not the kind of ignorance I'm talking about. I'm talking about the idea that there are unknowable things, and things that aren't worth knowing. If they realize that, then religion would lose its monopoly on truth, because it can't keep you in its grips. It no longer has that power, and that would be um, what's gotten rid of it. But the problem with doing this is that people aren't very happy to recognize their ignorance because it's seen as a shameful thing. If you say, I don't know, if you say, I don't know what you're talking about, I have nothing to contribute, I don't know the answer and I can't know the answer, it's very deflating. But it shouldn't be. I don't understand why it's seen as such a negative thing to not know the answers to certain questions. Um, if you think of as a story that I'm sure many of you, especially those from the university faculty, will be familiar with, recounted by Plato of, of Socrates when he was informed by a friend that the oracle had, had said that he was the most wise man in all of Greece. And Socrates couldn't believe it, but he knew the oracle couldn't lie. And so he went and spoke to all the people who had a reputation for wisdom. And he realized that the politician sounded like they knew what they were saying, but didn't actually understand it. The artist could express themselves, but couldn't explain in plain terms what they were doing. And what he realized was the problem was that the people with the reputation for wisdom actually knew nothing. And his recognition that he knew nothing was what made him so wise. Because everybody has areas of their life, and some people are ignorant about most things, in fact. Um, but it's not what you're ignorant about, it's your ability to recognize that ignorance. And this is something religion can't do. It ignores its ignorance, but if it was willing to, uh, to have some kind of self-reflection, realize that there are certain things it can't know, it would collapse, and so it can't do it. The problem is that doing that, having that self-reflection, is the only thing that we can do to progress society. And so by definition, it means that religion is something that will impede uh, the progress of science. And if you don't believe me, open a history book. And so that's why it's not just a case that religion is bad, but the one thing that people say it's so good for, for answering the questions that you need to have answered, is a lie. It's a con at best. And that's precisely and, and succinctly why I think religion is overrated. Of course, I have more, but I'd like to open the uh, floor to, to questions um, and, and take anything that you have, especially if you disagree with me. If there's somebody who is religious or disagrees with my diagnosis, I'd love to hear from you. But um, in the meantime, I think I'll, I'll pass over the mic. So thank you so much for coming and thank you for listening. Are there any questions? I think we have another. Thank you. Uh, do we have another microphone? My question is for Alex. So in a Rubin report, uh, Michael Schumer and Dennis Prager had a discussion. And uh, Dennis Prager said that atheists as a, an atheist can have a morality, but he doesn't believe that morality can be uh, on a global scale. So that secular morality can't be all over the world that the world would, would collapse. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I think that falls under the category of a lie, of a con. He's, he's completely wrong about that. I mean, the first problem is religious pluralism. Okay, you can say that 
Um, it takes religion to instill a morality that's universal. But which religion are you going to choose? It's not the case. It, it's often that the lie is told over and over again that religious people get their morality from their religion. That's not true. The religion gets the morality from the people. You see, this is why schisms happen, because people have a religion, and the, the religion disagrees with them about something. In my country, when the Church of England allowed women to become priests, there was a mass exodus, and people were moving to the Catholic Church. And it goes to show that, the, that the, the morality that they have doesn't come from their religion, but rather the other way around. Um, the thing about secular morality is that it has much more, it, 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 it has a stronger uh, connection to the scientific method. Okay, you read the works of people like Sam Harris, is probably the, 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 the name to, to bring up. I disagree with Sam Harris about morality being objective, there's no God. But the one point that he does make is he says that whether it's objective or whether it's subjective, we can all agree that if we mean anything by morality, if we mean anything by right and wrong, we're talking about well-being. And if we can all agree that the thing that we want and the thing that we base our morality upon is the well-being of individuals, then we can find out facts about how to improve well-being. We can understand how human biology and psychology works, and we can work towards a situation where the morality lines up perfectly by what we've uncovered through the scientific method. That's the kind of secular morality that people like me and people like uh, Michael Sherman would, would like to see. But Dennis Prager would interpret secular morality as this idea of throwing your arms up in the air and saying, you can just believe whatever you like morally, do as you please, there needs to be no sort of harmony between people because there's no God, there's no authority. No, it's not that there's no guiding principle, it's just that we've swapped that guiding principle from God to humanity. And I think that if morality is supposed to be being applied to humans, then we should get it as close to us as possible. And if we can, even if there were a God, if we could develop a morality that was based upon something a little closer to home, that's the single best way to argue your case, because if you have a religious morality, you're not going to convince someone of another religion. But if you have a secular morality, you might convince a religious person that yours is more grounded closer to home, and that's the only way that you can even hope to have a universal morality. So frankly, I don't know what Dennis Prager is talking about. So there. <laughs> Any other questions? Hello, Alex. Uh, I'm intrigued by your statement that some things are not worth knowing because uh, that statement actually sounds to me more like something a religious person would say because religion tends to want to have a monopoly on knowledge on what is allowed to be known and what is not allowed to be known what is supposed to be taboo, right? So, isn't the basis of science a sort of curiosity like Leonardo da Vinci digging up uh, cadavers from graves in order to perform dissections and break a taboo at the time. So how can you possibly say that something is not worth knowing if behind that question of any sort is human curiosity? Uh, I, I, perhaps I should have been a, a bit more clear. I think there are certain things I think there are certain questions that, that aren't worth asking or, or aren't worth searching for an answer to, and generally that relates to the why questions. The reason I think they're not worth knowing isn't because they won't be of value to us, but because they're unknowable. Certain questions, like the question of the purpose of life, or the why are we here, you may as well ask why, why um, a, a, a banana is, is yellow. Not, not how, I mean, you can understand the science behind why that happens, but why in the sense of purpose. That, to me, is a, is a question that's not worth ask, uh, asking or, or attempting to answer. But you're right in saying that, that science is driven by ignorance. But the key thing is, like I say, if we can recognize our ignorance, we can understand the sort of questions that are worth asking. And, of course, we need that. We need to understand what, what we need answers to before science can, can grow. But the, the, the difference between that and religion is that um, science, as it, answers, as, as it answers things, it actually creates more questions. Um, and so... The thing about science, and the wonderful thing about science, is that there's always going to be something to uncover. There's always going to be something to, to try and find an answer to. And so we can recognize that there are certain questions that aren't worth asking. And people might disagree what they are, but I think that we can concede that there are some questions that are just not worth answering. Um, and those tend to be the why questions. But we should also make sure to recognize, uh, in fact, by doing that, by, by, by eliminating certain questions, the questions that we have left and the, and the scientific progress we're making now, we can justify it even more because we can say that we recognize what are the questions worth asking. 
And so when science is making strides and saying, actually, no, we do want to put money into stem cell research, and we can say, well, we know this because we've ruled out the things that aren't worth our time. We've had enough time to work out where we should put our money, where we should put our attention. And we can only do that if we can recognize that certain questions aren't worth asking. Yeah, um, you, you can formulate questions very, very easily, can't you? But that doesn't make the question itself something that we need to spend a great deal of time on. But don't let me put you off asking questions. <laughs> So, are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, I've read um, an internet article a while back uh, in which the writer uh, argued that although that more and more people are becoming skeptic and secular and atheist in the world, that a lot of people are replacing religion with uh, the ideology of neoliberalism. So, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I think the, the, the main thing about swapping God, it, it's like what I was saying about swapping our, our morality, our basis of morality from God to something else. Now, I think you're sort of driving at, at the same thing. What people are beginning to do as uh, countries and, and, and the world becomes more and more secular, forget about atheism, but secularism, what they're beginning to do is they're trying to justify their principles and the way that they run the world and the way that they, uh, they, they govern and the way that they control people not by reference to God, but by reference to other principles. Um, and it, it may be neoliberalism, it, it, it may be anything. Um, the thing I would say is that even if, um, if people are, are developing political ideologies that they're using to run the world, um, those can be right or wrong, and it's not so much of a problem, because you can argue about them, because they're not claiming divine warrant. You can argue about them, and they're on, their cards are on the table. You, you, can, you can see exactly where people are basing their, their um, ideas. And uh, if, if that's what's happening, which I think it is, is what's happening, people are beginning more generally, not just specifically what you said, but more generally taking the basis of government, the basis of society, the basis of morality away from God and towards some political principles. And that might be the principle of liberty, that might be the principle of constitutionalism, whatever. Um, those principles arguably are as imaginary as any God, because you're just sort of making it up and saying this is something we should abide by. But as long as you're not claiming that it's a God, you can argue it a lot more easily. And I think it's a good thing if that's what's happening. And it's happening in certain areas, like it's happening in my country certainly, although we're still a religious country. More and more we're seeing appeals not to God, but to democracy. Uh, the recent EU referendum that happened, nobody, came, nobody even brought up religion. I mean, that's a non sequitur. What happened was, people were claiming we need to respect democracy, we need to respect the will of the people, we need to respect um, liberty, we need to respect etc. etc. You know, good, good economic principles, whatever. Didn't even come into it. Um, and so, whether or not, I, I know I haven't spoken specifically about the, the example you gave, but more generally, um, if that's what's happening, then it's certainly a, a good thing. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Evans. Um, I've always always been fascinated by cults and how they uh, suck people in and then just don't let go. And I've always wondered how would you go about freeing someone you love or someone you know who is in a cult? How can you convince them that everything that they're being told is a lie? It's not easy, of course, especially in uh, in cults. That's a fantastic question. That's actually the million dollar question that I get asked an awful lot. And the, the answer that I give, and it's a bit too easy to give this answer, but it's nevertheless true, is that there's no magic bullet. If there was an easy proven way in every instance, an easy kind of cookie cutter thing that you could deploy that would wake someone up from being in a cult, there would be no more cults. Because everyone who's in a cult, they would figure out a way of uh, they would have someone who cares enough about them to want to wake them up. But in my own situation, uh, my wife, who is Croatian, I obviously realised I was in a cult, and she was in the cult with me. And then there was these, there were these awkward conversations that you need to have, where you're saying, you know, listen, darling, I don't believe this anymore. What are we going to do? And she basically joined me in waking up, but she was an hour. She was an hour. She was a year behind me in waking up. And I can only say that if, if there was any, any strategy that I employed, it was to be kind, to be patient, 
to not to rush things and to not to push information in her face. So if I, if I uncovered some information and I was genuinely excited about it, I might say, you're never going to believe what I've just found out about uh, Watchtower or, or some, something that happened, some scandal. But generally speaking, I let her come to me with questions. I let her drive the process. And that's the, that's the approach I try to take more generally with my activism, is to just try and be kind, try to dispel the uh, perception that witnesses have or cult members have that apostates are out to get them, apostates are out to corrupt them, apostates are horrible, nasty people who don't have any morals. Um, the more stereotypes you can dispel, the better. That's my only advice. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, my question is also for Lloyd. Will you give us an example of a situation where a Jehovah's Witness would uh, express his doubts and then the elders or some other Jehovah's Witness would say something to him which would basically make him feel stupid for asking the question in the first place? Sure. So, basically when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're not really allowed to have doubts. You... There's a lot of literature on this subject, basically you're encouraged to wait on Jehovah, that's the kind of language that you're given. And waiting on Jehovah essentially means no longer thinking so much about uh, the rights and wrongs, but just allowing Jehovah to answer the question in his own good time, essentially burying your head in the sand. And that's the situation that faces anybody who uh, starts down that process. I'm actually writing a book, a second book at the moment, which is a guidebook for people in that situation. And some of my advice will be to involve elders as little as possible. Because elders don't really have any answers. I, I've been an elder myself. Elders don't really have any answers for people with doubts other than what's already written in the literature. So if you can't find your answers in the literature, you can't expect to find it from an elder. And actually elders are trained to make your life difficult if they detect that you might be, start, might be starting down the road to apostasy. So I'm encouraging witnesses in that situation to avoid elders as much as possible and cancel them out of the equation. But that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Uh, I have a uh, question for Alex. Which theist argument do you think it makes the most sense or is the most valid? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Well, traditionally when, when people such as myself are asked that question, which is a fascinating question actually, because uh, the, the majority of people, I've, in my experience, tend to go for this fine-tuning argument, which surprises me actually, because I don't find it all too convincing. Um, that, I mean, generally speaking, that's what people, people go for, and that, that's what you tend to get for the, an answer to that question. But for me personally, one of the main things was, was quite a specific thing, actually. I was, I, was, I was considering this idea about the universe needing a cause. And uh, at that time, my, my philosophy was leaning towards the idea that the universe probably had some kind of cause, but that cause didn't necessarily need to be God. It could have been anything. It could be a, a multiverse, it could be, you, know, you, you name it. Um, the problem I had was, was uh, presented to me in the form, something along the lines of, well, if we have an infinite cause, which it must be if it's outside of the universe and outside of time, um, but a finite effect, that is the universe, uh, that doesn't make any sense unless this infinite cause made some kind of choice or had some kind of decision-making process. Because, of course, if you have an infinite cause with, with infinite time, then almost by definition, the, the, core, the, the, sorry, the effect would need to be infinite too. And I didn't quite understand why it was that um, an infinite cause could cause a finite effect. It didn't seem to make much sense to me. Um, I've now come to the opinion that I don't think the universe necessarily needs a cause at all, and so that no longer troubles me, but that was the thing that, that sort of kept me up um, the most. Um, but then I was, I was relatively young when I started sort of having doubts about religion, so during that period, the, the main arguments were the sort of traditional ones. Just this idea, where does everything come from? You know, is there really an explanation for, um, for, for, for how the universe got going? And uh, the, the why questions did bother me. 
um, for a time. I was thinking, you know, there must be some kind of purpose. There must be a, a why are we here? What's the point in all of this? You know, at least denialism if you're not careful. But that's why I've come to this opinion that we need to recognize that certain questions just aren't worth asking. Because those are the kind of questions that people get hung up on, and they, they, they hung me up too. Um, so at that time, it was those kinds of things. I've recognized they're no longer important questions. Uh, the second more specific thing, more recently, was this idea of, of causation. But even that, I've, I've um, somewhat reconciled. And I've spoken about that before, why I think the universe doesn't need a cause. Um, but that probably gave me the most cause for thought. Any other questions? Are we off the hook? Oh, sorry. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just to try to formulate the question in the right way. Um, first of all, thank you for coming and thank you for this uh, evening. It's a pleasure. I found out about this today, so we rushed here. <laughs> it's great. Uh, second, uh, we saw that right-wing fundamentalists often used, for example, Sam Harris's arguments in order to spread uh, Islamophobia, for an example. Here we have, uh, still we have, a refugee crisis uh, in Croatia, Germany, in all of the other countries, and we are divided into two, maybe we can say, groups. The ones who want to help the people and ones who are really afraid and they don't want to let them in or help. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to simplify. So, uh, what are your thoughts? I, I mean, both of yours. Uh, thoughts. It's a question for both of, both of you. What are your thoughts on uh, how can we criticize uh, not only Islam but religion in a kind way, uh, not to uh, not to feed phobias simultaneously? I think it's a big problem. So, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. It, it is a big problem, and it's something that concerns me, even though I consider myself British, I also kind of consider myself Croatian because I live here. And uh, I think the refugee crisis has taken everyone by surprise. It's, it's one thing for something to be happening in a distant land, but when you're feeling the effects yourself or, or you're seeing the effects on the news, um, I agree with much of what Sam Harris says about Islam. And one thing that I respect about Sam Harris is that he is... Uh, open to considering the thoughts of those who are trying to work for reform. He's open to listening to ex-Muslims and what they have to say. And I think that when you when you aggregate all of this knowledge, it, it, it raises more interesting questions, such as what are governments doing to stop radicalization at source? So it's one thing to have uh, Muslims, I think we can all recognize that the vast majority of Muslims don't want to kill us, but we still recognize that Islam, the Quran, the Hadith, contain incitements to violence. So how do we deal with that? What measures do we put in place to make it almost impossible to radicalize someone? How do we inoculate young people? How do we have programs put in place, say at schools, so that children are taught to see cults for what they are, taught their critical thinking skills as early as possible so that it's almost impossible for imams to radicalize young people. So I think that there's lots of areas in which these issues can be addressed that just simply aren't being addressed. And when those simple measures aren't taken, it's easier for the far right to find its voice and say, oh well, they're not doing anything so here's our Here's our alternative. I don't know what your thoughts are. I'd, I'd pick up on the last point there. Um, the reason why people will flock to right-wing fundamentalists when they fear, uh, and they have quite legitimate fears of Islam, or even immigration, um, the reason they flock to the right is because nobody on the left is willing to talk about it. That's precisely the problem. And when they try to do it, they cause some kind of civil war intellectually, and nobody wants to platform them anymore. This is why people as mild and, 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 and lovable as Richard Dawkins have been no platformed because of their criticism of Islam. Um, one of the things we have to recognize, of course, is the difference between Islam and Muslims. You know, Like uh, you probably can uh, understand from the things that Lloyd has said and, and says in his book about family and, and, and people he knows 
who are stuck in this cult, the main thing to sort of recognize is that you can hate the cult, you can hate the religion, but recognize that the people who are living under it, by and large, have been conned, they've been fooled, and they shouldn't be blamed for it. So you should be criticizing the thing that fooled them, hoping to show them the light, not show them the door, if you know what I'm saying. Um, Sam Harris in particular, the problem when you're someone like Sam Harris who talks about controversial subjects is you will get misrepresented. Fairly recently, he had a podcast with uh, his friend and, and colleague Majid Nawaz, who is a, a sort of modern-day hero for Islamist reform, uh, sorry, Islamic reform. Um, and during the podcast, there was a point at which Sam Harris said, you know, there are some people who think this way, you know, why can't we just get rid of all Muslims? The world would be so much better off if there were no Muslims. And then you had, um, was it... I don't want to, I don't want, it, I'm pretty sure it was Reza Aslan, I don't want to um, uh, put a bad candle to someone's name, but somebody, anyway, this is the point, um, they took the clip where he'd said, you know, some people say, why don't we just get rid of all Muslims, and the clip was just Sam Harris saying, why don't we just get rid of all Muslims, the world would be a better place with no Muslims, and he posted that and said, see, look at Sam Harris, this right wing bigot, and completely misrepresented his views. And that's the kind of thing that we're just going to come up against. But the one thing we can do to tackle that is as people who are reasonable people, who aren't flocking to the far right, we stand in, in defense of, of Sam Harris and say, well, I'm sorry, you know, I agree with you. And you probably just heard this clip and been misled. But Sam Harris is a reasonable person. And you should know better than to think him, he would say something like that. Especially when Majid Nawaz, who is a Muslim, was on the podcast going, mm -hmm, yeah, mm, yeah, throughout the whole thing. You know, what kind of... Of, of, of mental deterioration does it take to think that kind of thing? Well, I, I'm afraid it, it's, the, it's the same kind of mental deterioration which uh, makes it difficult for people to separate Islam from Muslims and think that any kind of criticism of Islam is to say something that's, uh, to, to Muslims as people. Majid Nawaz spends copious amounts of time um, defending the difference between Islam, which he loves, and Islamism, which he hates. Um, you may or may not agree with that, with that um, distinction, but people are unwilling to have the conversation whatsoever. It's like you either take uh, Islam wholesale and think it's the best thing in the world and completely peaceful and, and something that we all need and, 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 and would love to have in our communities, or you're a right-wing bigot. No, there can be middle ground, and I think that more of us who don't want to be aligned with the far right should be willing to say, no, I, I'm not with them, but I'm with them on this issue. Um, or, or a lot of people are with them on this issue because no, none of us are willing to talk about it. We need to create a, a space in which they're, they're able to, to speak about that stuff. Until that happens, all we're going to see is more and more people flocking over there. And when they start flocking over there and they start listening to what they're saying, the rest of the right-wing views engulf them. And so not only do we have now people who dislike Islam, who've moved over and sort of identify there, we now have people who dislike Islam, get pulled to the right, convinced that Muslims are the problem, and convinced of a whole load of other uh, far-right tribe. And they end up uh, irredeemable. Whereas we could have stopped the entire thing happening if we could have just recognized from the very beginning that these people are making reasonable points, and we shouldn't chastise them for it. Well... <laughs> But, but hey, what, what a relevant point, so thank you for bringing that up, and I think it's something that we've all grappled with. How do we deal with this, you know? Another question. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question for, like, for Alex. Uh, so, uh, I know the idea is repulsive, but uh, I want to be a devil's advocate for Prager, and uh, I know uh, what his rebuttal to your uh, argument would be. So he would say, uh, what is well-being? Uh, what would you define it? Would you define it for an individual, for society? Uh, and uh, how do you uh, incorporate well-being of a new generation? Or how much of your well-being would you put uh, aside for a well-being of a ne next generation? So what are the... Well, the, the key thing to sort of to note is that we don't necessarily have an answer for that, but that that's, that's not a problem because, um, again, I think I'll appeal to Sam Harris here a little bit, and what, what he says is that um, the science of morality is, is very young, and he considers it a science. He says it's very young and it needs a lot more work, and it's only because people haven't really thought about it before. 
um, that we don't have these answers. We, we don't necessarily have a clear definition of what we can count as well-being. Sam Harris makes attempts, um, but one of the key points he makes is that we, we don't need to have a, a, a clear-cut definition, this is good, this is better than this good, and have a, a completely clear-cut thing. He compares it to food in the way that we might not be able to say, is an apple healthier than an orange? or a banana, you know, which is healthier. We, we don't necessarily know the answer to that, but that doesn't mean that we can't recognize the difference between an apple and a, a packet of, of chips and crisps. You know, we can say that one is definitely healthier than the other, um, so we might not have this, this clear-cut uh, definition. Um, I, I don't necessarily know. One, one of the main problems, the main questions that we're going to have to face if we adopt a kind of well-being approach to morality is uh, do we include animals in that, for instance? Um, how, how are we going to incorporate that? You know, is the well-being of a human worth that of an animal? Um, and if not, then what's the ratio? Um, and you, you start, and you still have to keep moral philosophy because you, you still have the, the moral problems, the, the trolley problem, arguments of utilitarianism. Um, you're still going to have those problems. But I think the, the, the point to make is that let's not pretend that religion doesn't have that too. You know, religion uh, poses as though it can present this clear-cut morality that speak to five different Catholics, and you'll get five different moralities. And so you can, you can accuse secular morality as being disjointed, and people can't agree with what we mean by well-being, and all have their own different definitions. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, different Christians, different Muslims, different Jews, different whoever, have different ideas of what God is. You know, I have a different idea of what well-being is to you, you have a different idea of what God is to me. There's no, there's no real difference there. And if Dennis Prager were to criticize my argument in that way, I'd turn it right back around on him and say, well, you do the same thing. But that's not necessarily a problem, as long as we can just say that we both do that, so let's take that out of the consideration, and just accepting that we're both going to have that problem. Let's see which is going to be better anyway. And, and acknowledging that though, yes, secular morality has its problems, especially in terms of defining well-being, Religion has problems, and it has more problems, and that's why the secular morality is probably the better which to take. But we have to be careful not to present it as a perfect answer, because again, when it comes to morality, I don't think there can be a perfect answer, so to speak. But there can be a better answer than we had yesterday. And if today we have more religious morality, then the better answer we can have tomorrow will be secular morality. It won't be perfect, but it'll be a step in the right direction. Any more questions? I have a question. Okay. Uh, to the both of you. What do you think uh, will be the future of Islam? I know that uh, globalization is now starting. And, uh, you know, these countries are starting to open up a little bit by bit. So what do you think in the next, I don't know, 50 years? I had a conversation with Yasmin Mohammed about this on my channel. Uh, little channel plug. My channel is called the John Cedars channel. And... Uh, Yasmin is, um, is an ex-Muslim activist and we talked about this because there's a, there, are, there are those who believe that Islam, maybe it can, either they believe it can be reformed or they believe that we should try and reform it or that there should be some attempts to reform it. And then there are those like Yasmin and a number of other ex-Muslims who say, look, this ain't going to be reformed because it's actually enshrined in the Quran and in the Hadith. These are things that you, could, you can't just kind of turn your back on. Um, and we kind of talked about this, Yasmin and I, and we kind of reached the conclusion that it's just going to have to be a slow, steady process of people in Islamic countries, because that's the main problem, is that the, the countries where Islam is dominant and Islam has power, we need to give people in those countries the chance to think and the chance to breathe and the chance to realize that there is an alternative. And that's why I think that ex-Muslims like Yasmin, like Imtiaz Shams, like Sarah Haider, they, they need us to put them on a pedestal and support them as much as possible because they get so much grief, so much aggravation, so much hatred. If we can amplify their voices so that those in their Muslim countries can have something to latch onto, some shred of hope, we might just accelerate the, the spread of secularism in the Islamic world. Uh, I, I would say to those who think that it, it can't be reformed, I understand why you might think that. And I, I can't remember who said it before me, this isn't an original thought, but just consider for a moment, if you think it's going to be too hard to reform Islam, 
think about the alternative. How hard is it going to be to convince all of these people to leave the faith? It's, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. So the, the very best we can do if we're going to do anything is, is make attempts at reform. As far as if it will reform or not, I think Islam could be on the brink of an enlightenment, just as Christianity was. And, and you say, you made the point that somebody had made um, that, that, you know, sorry, Islam is, is constitutionally this way. It can't be changed. That's how Christianity was too. You know, that there is always room to maneuver. All we need is a kind of um, secular, liberal enlightenment of Islam. But again, the only way that's going to happen is when we have more people on the liberal side of the spectrum supporting the idea that Islam needs reform. Okay, so the first uh, step in the right direction is, you know, forget about reforming Islam for now. The first thing we need to do is convince people that it needs reforming, and that's mainly people on the left. Um, because people people aren't willing to do that. And the only the only place that, that a liberal enlightenment of Islam and liberal reform is going to come from is the left. And so the best thing that we can do is, is talk to the left and say, look, you know, let's take a look at this. Look at how it is now. If we get your support on this, you don't have to discount Islam. You don't have to discount Muslims. You just have to recognize that there could be a better Islam, one that's, one that's more aligned with the principles of people like Majid Nawaz than it is with people like Anjem Chowdhury. You know, it's very possible to do this, but we need your support. We need you at the very least to recognize that there's a problem. I don't need you to be, you know, out, out in the street with a sign shouting outside of your local mosque, but at least show solidarity and recognize that there's a problem. And then when I do what I do, and Moy does what he does, and everybody, and Sam Harris does what he does, you know, we don't have these liberals coming out and, and, and pushing us to do that, but we have their support, and they're not going to be criticizing us anymore. And if it comes to the point, where we need the support, where we need the backing, we'll have it. Um, but before we can even think about trying to reform anything, we need people who are going to be complicit in the reformation of Islam. Um, that is the most important thing. Whether that's going to happen, I, I'm skeptical. I'm, I'm very, um, I'm quite pessimistic because of the way that, that this uh, sort of anti-free speech movements are going, especially in America, people trying to just shut down criticisms. If that keeps going, then we can kiss goodbye to Islamic reform, and we can kiss goodbye to the liberation of millions of Muslims who are currently living in just abject conditions, who could be freed by a secular enlightenment. We can kiss that goodbye if, uh, we're, if, if this keeps going the way it's going, and people are still willing to get up in arms about ridiculous um, false blasphemy laws that are practically being instilled. You know, if you say you can't criticize Islam, that's a blasphemy law. I'm sorry, that's, that's just how it is. And if that keeps going, I'm incredibly pessimistic. Um, but hopefully, uh, especially given the amount of people who are here, it's very, very promising. Because if all of us can uh, make ourselves heard and say, no, we're not going to stand for this. We're not going to stand for our right to criticize things taken away. Of course, that means we have to be willing to let other people criticize our ideas too, because it's a matter of principle. But if we're willing enough and brave enough to do that, then it could happen. But, you know, I'm not going to be able to do it by myself, neither Lloyd, neither Sam Harris. It's going to take all of us, I'm afraid. Any more questions? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so living in a Christian, Christian majority country uh, as Croatia, I'm often compelled to argue my points as an outspoken atheist. And usually the, the, the debate goes on for some time until the point comes that religion came from human, humans, somehow came up with religion, ergo religion is natural, and even after arguing that uh, the, which religion is then natural and a newborn baby will not be born with religion, this is usually the roadblock that I face most often uh, while arguing. So, so they argue that religion's okay because it's natural? They argue that religion is true because it's natural because humanity came up with it. Do you want to have a stab at that? Yes. Um, it's true that uh, for a time it was perfectly it was perfectly natural, and it came about through a process of uh, evolution. It was perfectly normal for human societies in the past um, to to be religious. Um, things that also used to be natural include things like rape. That used to be a natural uh, human um, thing to do in, in a certain time in, in, in human history. But, you know, it doesn't matter if it used to be useful or if it's a, if it's a product of nature. Um, what matters is that we can recognize that even if it is a product of nature, we don't need it anymore. I was actually talking to Lloyd about this the other day, and um, 
I can't remember the, the first example I gave, but I remember the second, that uh, religion is, is a little bit like a, uh, something you put in your shoe to, to give, it, give it a shape. What would you, what would you call that? Like a, a shoe insole, if you know what I mean, uh, to shape the foot. In that it may be useful and even necessary to begin with to help shape the foot. But once it's served its purpose, you need to get it out, because if you leave it in there for too long, it's going to deform the foot. And so, yeah, religion may have been natural, and it may have come about, probably through evolutionary processes, in order to sustain societies and promote communities. That, that's a possible thing to say, but we can recognize that we don't need it anymore. And there's actually the argument to be made that religion isn't, in fact, natural, that it's actually just a byproduct of other natural phenomena that go, in, uh, that go on. Uh, in, in the human sort of psychology. The reason it stuck around is because the, the whatever evolutionary effect is causing religion as a side effect, though religion is harmful, it's worth the benefit of whatever the, the other effect is. You know, we don't really know. It's a bit like um, Richard Dawkins has given the example that flies will often uh, just fly straight into candles, or moths, sorry, they'll, they'll fly straight into candle flames and die. And you could ask the question, um, why is it natural for, for moths to commit suicide, to kill themselves with a flame? Well, no, it's, it's to do with the fact that moths have developed the ability to navigate using light, and therefore when they have light to the really close that they didn't evolve for, it confuses them and they spiral out of control and die in the flame. Now, we could ask, you know, but, but moths committing suicide, moths killing themselves is natural, so it must be a good thing. No, not necessarily. It might just be a byproduct of a more useful evolutionary effect, if you see what I'm saying. But even if that's not the case, even if religion just overtly was useful, well, the key, the key word there is was. It's past tense. It's not useful anymore, as far as I'm concerned. Imagine if we ran hospital maternity units according to what's natural and what's not natural. Um, think of the amount of children that are born that shouldn't be alive and they're only alive because medical science has made it possible for them to be alive. You know, nature can be very, very cruel sometimes, and if we have found a way of outgrowing ourselves and moving forward as a species that isn't natural and it makes things better for us because we no longer believe nonsense, I'm all for it. Any, yeah, another question? Hi. Uh, would you say that there are ways of reading uh any holy scriptures, uh, such as like reading it as a metaphor or an allegory, would you say that uh, that is a valid way of doing it? What are your thoughts on that? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of moderate believers um, in the monotheisms do read do read the books that way. And there's an argument we were just talking about Islamic reform for trying to persuade as many Muslims as possible to interpret the Quran and Hadith as our allegory. I've actually had a quite a long conversation with somebody who was explaining to me the concept of jihad from a symbolic point of view and trying to persuade me that, well, there's different ways of interpreting jihad that don't involve people killing each other. It can be a symbolic thing. It can be your internal jihad where you're warring against yourself. You're warring against your sinful fleshly nature. Listen, if you can believe that, <laughs> go for it. I personally wouldn't be able to buy it, but I'd much rather... Uh, have people buying that than trying to kill me. So the fact that there are sufficient numbers of Muslims that can interpret jihad that way uh, actually encourages me that it's a good thing for some of these obscene, barbaric, medieval texts to be interpreted as allegory. I'd only really echo what, what Lloyd has already said in that if, if you ask me to read these texts and, and, and tell you what I think, depending on the specific uh, verses, there are certain parts which I think were perhaps intended to be allegorical. Uh, there are certain parts which I think simply weren't. You know, the, the laws of the Torah are, are quite explicit in, in, in what, they, what they are. Some people, however, seem to be able to interpret them in a way that either discounts them or sees them as, as metaphors. Now, Theologically speaking, I disagree with that. I say, no, that, that's not what the authors meant, that's, that's not what the Bible is trying to say, that's not what the Quran is trying to say. But at the same time, it's, it's difficult because I'd much rather you believe that than you believe in the literal truth. So while I think that you should read it literally, if, if you're speaking purely theologically, I think it makes more sense to read it literally. But politically, I'd much rather you took it as a metaphor, if you see what I'm saying. Um, 
And that's why if you're discussing with somebody like a, like a reformer, you should try and shift it away from philosophical uh, discussions about the nature of the text and move it to the sort of political side saying, what's actually going to be better if you interpret it this way or if you interpret it this way? Um, we need to recognize that yes, there is a legitimate interpretation of, say, the Quran, which can be peaceful. Um, but we need to recognize at the same time that ISIS's uh, interpretation of the Quran is legitimate. I mean, you can read the Quran and justify everything that ISIS is doing and more. Right? We need to recognize that. Um, and someone like Majid Nawaz, which is, I've mentioned his name three times now because he's so great on this, he says, as a Muslim, he says on, on his radio show regularly, ISIS's interpretation of the Quran is legitimate. It, it's a legitimate interpretation. But I think I have another legitimate interpretation, which is better. Um, so to me, yeah, you can read it either way. I suppose, I know which way I'd read it, but I know which way I'd rather a believer read it, if you see what I'm saying. Um, so depending on what sort of mood I'm in and what sort of conversation I'm having, I could really argue either way. Um, I'll t we'll take more questions if they're there. I just want to thank Hugo Bar and his staff for being so amazing in helping us host this event. Uh, I just also want to thank Hervoy uh, for filming this. Hervoy has his own YouTube channel, which is called Hervoy Near Bed. So you should all subscribe to his YouTube channel. I believe he has amazing music. Isn't that right, Hervoy? So we'll continue until we're kind of ushered away from the microphone. Does anyone have any other an, an, a question over there? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, so uh, whenever I, I uh, point out the little things in the Bible, people always say that um, it's the question of faith, not logic. So I'm wondering how would you try to direct people in thinking skeptically? That's a brilliant question. Um, well. I can answer that from a Jehovah's Witness perspective or I can answer it from the perspective of someone who just simply believed in the Bible as the literal word of God. And if we're going to base our beliefs on faith, my question would be, well, which faith do we choose? Because if all of the faiths say, hey, this is what we think happened and you just have to have faith, then how do we determine which faith we're going to choose? Um, it's, it's one of those strange things about dealing with devout people is trying to make them value logic and reason. And the way I do it with Jehovah's Witnesses is to simply say, listen, is it true or not? Either you can prove, either, either you can prove the theological claims that are the basis, the bedrock of your beliefs, or you can't. With Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that God chose the Watchtower Society in 1919 and made it his one and only true organization. Great, so what's your evidence for that? Oh, you don't have any? Oh, it's all about faith, is it? Oh, well, in that case, I can just go to any other religion because it's all about faith for them as well. We can go to a non-Christian religion. We can go into Hinduism. We can go into Shinto. We can go into Jainism. It really doesn't matter if it's just all about faith. Yeah, faith, faith is incredibly overrated. Uh, one of the... What you often find, actually, um, is, as an atheist, people often say to me, well, you have no evidence that there is no God, so your position is just based upon faith. Um, firstly, that's entirely wrong, but even if it wasn't, you know, the criticism that, that I'm basing my belief on faith, I mean, that's what you're doing too, so that's not necessarily a, a, a problem. Why, why are you going to sort of throw that accusation at me? The same can be applied to you. Um, the thing about faith is that by definition, it, it's, it's belief without evidence. Okay, if you have faith in something, and suddenly you find some evidence in favor of that something, it's no longer faith, it's reasoned arguments, it's, it's, evidential, um, it's an evidential position. Right? For it to be faith, there needs to be no evidence. And so for someone to say, my position is based on faith, that's synonymous, that's the same thing as saying, my position is based on a complete lack of evidence. Okay, if that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. But you should say that's what you're doing. You should, you, should, you should admit that your position has no evidence. Because if it had evidence, it wouldn't need to be, you wouldn't need to appeal to faith like that. And when people are willing to look at it like that, um, because faith is seen as some kind of virtue, when people say, you know, it's my faith, you have to respect it, people often sort of give a, a nod and say, okay, yeah, sure, faith. Because it's just one of those, one of those words that people just learn to, to take as an explanation in itself. 
we need to say, no, stop. What do you mean by that? Because what you really mean is belief without evidence. And a lot of the time, people haven't really even considered that. They don't know what faith really means, but that is what it means. And if, if, if any rational person was able to stand up and say, I believe this, and I say, why? And they say, well, because I have no evidence for it. That's what they're doing, you know? And we need to make them, you basically need to make them aware that that's what they're doing. Any other questions? Yes? Um, hello. Hi. Um, so when we, when we establish that religion is um, bad, let's say, or not necessary, how do we remove it? Yeah, that's difficult. What do you, uh, in my own case, the question was, what do I replace it with? Because having woken up from my beliefs as a Jehovah's Witness, it was a case of, well, maybe I just need to be a Christian. Maybe I just need to believe in Jesus. And maybe there's some truth that just doesn't involve Jehovah's Witnesses. And in my own case, just purely by following the, the rabbit hole as deep as it went, I realized that none of the religious texts hold any real value in terms of being substantiated. But I did find along this journey, and I think it's a journey that's deeply personal to people, it's a journey that you have to take yourself and not have, or you can't be ordered to take this journey, but you, you kind of reach the kind of train station stop of being an atheist, but then there's maybe another stop along the line, and that's to be a humanist. You can be an atheist and not be, be a humanist. And my own personal spirituality, what I've replaced my religion with, is the, is the belief that as a species, it's worthwhile to see humans progress and advance, if only so I can see future generations prosper, so that my daughter Jessica, who incidentally is being shunned by her Jehovah's Witness grandfather, back in England, who hasn't met her yet. She's three years old, and she hasn't met her grandfather. But at least she'll have a slightly better future if humanity can advance. So that's my kind of new religion, as it were. Oh, that and Star Wars. That's also my religion. <laughs> but we can replace it with what we want, basically. <laughs> How do we get rid of religion? I mean, to, to almost sound a bit... Uh, I mean, this, this is how we do it. We, we do it by discussing things. We do it by having rational conversations. You know, I can sit here and listen to what Lloyd is saying um, and hear arguments that I, that I hadn't heard before. I can then use them in the conversations that I have. We need to have discussions like this and we need to learn how to, how to argue our case because the one thing we can't do is we can't try and do this by force. You know, to, to say, to, 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 to attempt to say, you know, you shouldn't believe this, you're not allowed to believe this, we need to just banish this kind of thing, um, is, is horrendous. It's a, it's a dangerous and terrifying idea. Um, Lloyd and I have been speaking about, for instance, very briefly, we were talking about how um, Russia recently banned Jehovah's Witnesses as a cult. They just banned them, flat out banned. And although the pair of us think that Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the day that the last Jehovah's Witness reveals their faith is going to be a glorious day, the ban was a terrible idea. It's an awful idea. It's not the kind of way to go about it. Um, so the one thing you can't do if you're trying to get rid of religion, so to speak, is, is to actually try and try and force people to convert, because you're just not going to be able to do that. Um, it's going to have to be done um, through discussions like this. We have to be honest, and we have to recognize that not everybody's going to be happy about it. You know, there are some people who genuinely would be better off with comforting delusions than... Um, than knowing the truth, you know. My own grandmother is, is a Catholic, and, and she's, she's a perfectly happy person. She, she lives her life, she's great. Um, I, I wouldn't want to take that away from her, you know. I, I, I fear this idea of her losing her faith and becoming distraught by it. But as far as I'm concerned, to put it frankly, it's worth it. You know, I was, again, another thing I was talking to Lloyd about was um, an analogy I'd made before with, with the abolition of slavery. If you remember, well, I remember, but if you, if you consider um, the time of the abolition of slavery, there was a very uh, popular and very uh, convincing argument going around saying, if we abolish slavery, then there are some slaves who uh, live with, with masters, quote-unquote, who, who treat them humanely, who treat them well, they give them a home, and of course they work for them, but they, they treat them nicely. 
these slaves will be worse off when slavery is abolished because they'll have nowhere to go, they'll have no job, they'll have no home. The fact of the matter is, yes, that's true, there were certain slaves who were worse off after abolition. But is anybody going to try and argue that that means that slavery shouldn't have been abolished? Of course not. So we have to recognize that there will be certain detrimental effects. There will be certain people who, who may very well be worse off if, we, if we're making these arguments. And it might take a generation of change, um, a sort of intermediate generation of arguing these things before people can really begin to, to drop the religion. In the meantime, there are going to be people who are going to be upset. There are going to be people who will be annoyed and angry that they've been lied to and that their, their hope has been taken away from them in the last moments of their life. Um, but again, to, to be blunt and to be frank, uh, it's just the price we're going to have to pay um, if we're going to do this properly, because there's simply no alternative. You know, I'm not going to waver on the truth just because you don't like it. You know, the truth has this really annoying tendency to go on being the truth, even when this causes great inconveniences. You know, I'm sorry, if this is the way it is and this is the way I see it, then, I, then I'm going to have to make this argument. We have to recognize that there will be there will be detriments, there will be damage caused. Um, but we have to just weigh it up and say, is it worth it? And I think it is. Other questions? Yeah. Good evening, I have a question for you. Yeah. I was born here in Zagreb as a Catholic. And uh, as a young man, uh, I was really confused about the religions. And I did my own studies about it when I was in my 20s, now I'm 55. And I remember being exposed to certain sects, cults, like you say, Jehovah's Witnesses are called. Uh, I, also, I also went to other sects, like uh, Pentecostals, Baptists, Mormons. Uh, I don't know, there, there are plenty of them. But I realized one thing, that uh, most of them were established in 1880s, and that their founders were, uh, were Masons. I would like to know if you have any information about it, if you can explain a little bit about it as well. Is there any grand scheme behind it, like a plan to confuse the population? Why were they all launched at the same time, like in 1880s? And they all basically came from the States, you know. And also in Europe, uh, he just mentioned that Russia Putin banned Jehovah's Witnesses, probably for a reason. Uh, he banned other religions as well, like, uh, you know, Islamic religions like uh, Wahhabism, uh, Salafism, and so forth. I'm curious if you know anything about it. Why were they launched at the same time, or approximately the same time? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, Scientology was launched in the 1950s. Uh, Mormonism, uh, Joseph Smith, this is actually in my book, Joseph Smith was shot dead in, uh, in Illinois, I think it was, in 1843. That's when Adventism was around. It wasn't until 1879 that the Watchtower Society got started. Look, I don't, I don't think there was, we can read too much into into the dates. I think, bottom line, is it a harmful group of ideas or a benign group of ideas? And I tend to limit my criticism of religion to what's its real effects in people's lives. I'm not too concerned about any attachment to the occult. I can understand why if you are a, a believer, if you're someone who cares passionately about the Bible and believe it's a liter the literal word of God, why you would be very wary of the Freemasons and why you'd be wanting to you know, find evidence of Satanism or occultism, and even in Scientology, that L. Ron Hubbard had a period where he was dabbling in black magic, you know. Um, however they got there, they, the point is that they got there, and the point is that these religions are having real effects in people's lives. So I personally don't worry too much about precisely how they managed to come up with their ideas. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, this is weird. Uh, okay, so so far we've talked uh, about religion, and uh, I, I'd like to know how, how you see it because I, I see religion as a symptom and not not as a thing in itself. I think it's a lack of skepticism in yeah. general, yeah. and 
there are a lot of movements today which I wouldn't classify as religion, but that just like skepticism and are even worse. For example, like I know flat, flat Earth comes from like a religious background, but it's gained traction a lot just because there's like a critical mass of people that don't feel stupid discussing it, uh, and it's just I, I don't think it's religious in the sense that they have some. Okay, a lot of them, maybe even most of them, have like a central dogma, something that keeps them. But but it's not like uh, I don't think many of them fear some you know repercussions of not believing a flat earth. They just think they've been deceived the, the whole time, and now they've stumbled upon uh, on the truth. So sure, yeah. But that's why I think it's not as simple as just being an atheist. Probably, I'm guessing. I might be wrong, but I'm guessing a lot of you here are atheists, or agnostic, or just not religious. But for me, it's not as simple as just being an atheist. You also have to be a critical thinker, and you need to apply logic and reason, and demand evidence. And obviously, flat earthers will find evidence where they need to find evidence. Bottom line, none of it can be good enough. Uh, so if you apply logic and reason, then than religion in whatever form it takes. And when I talk about cults, by the way, I'm not just talking about religious cults. I'm talking about there are such things as therapy cults. There are such things as business scams. There's such things as, as human trafficking cults, almost. Cults can spring up in any number of guises. But what we need to do is empower ourselves with critical thinking skills, with logic and reason. If we have those, and that's why I mentioned before about school, about school children being taught these things. School children need to be taught, you know what, sometimes you're going to be told things that just don't make any sense. It could even be your family members that are telling you this. It could even be someone who you trust who's telling you this. But what you need to do is you need to apply these steps to find out whether it's true or not. This is what I think is lacking in education, or certainly not visible from, from where I'm looking. Yeah, no, I, I, I concur. The, um, if religion has come as some kind of product of our evolutionary tendencies or our psychology, um, then there may be certain parts of religion, that, that, or sort of certain parts of human nature that manifest themselves in religion, that were religion to disappear, would just manifest themselves in other ways. Uh, that may be the case, which is why I think you're absolutely right. Yes, it, it's not just about um, criticizing religion, is about criticizing religion and recognizing the truths about human nature that religion sort of projects and we can look at those and criticize those on a more fundamental level and this basic principle that nothing is, is set in stone, everything is, is open to question. Um, flat earthers, to be specific, I think one of the things you, you could mention uh, about those is to think, look, what would be the reason for uh, this kind of conspiracy? What would be the reason for the government to be lying to us that, that about the shape of the earth? The only thing that they can muster is religious. They say they're trying to ruin our faith in God because the Bible says that the earth is flat, or at least heavily implies it. You know, Isaiah says the circle of the earth, not the globe of the earth, uh, not the sphere of the earth, but the circle of the earth. Um, there's talk of a firmament in Genesis which goes over like a dome of the earth, holding the waters that lay above from falling underneath. Um, it, is, it is religious in, in its nature, uh, but again, all it is is it's a lack of critical thinking, it's a lack of exposure to different ideas, not just atheist ideas that, that, that reject uh, things that are in the Bible, but other biblical interpretations. Um, these, these are the things that are going to be, that, that are gonna be necessary. Um, but yeah, you might be right that, that certain parts of religion are just intrinsic to human nature, but again, that doesn't mean that they can't be criticized. And just because they're, they're um, showing themselves through religion today and may through, uh, show themselves through something else tomorrow, that doesn't mean that other parts of religion are, are, are fine or that, or that because they're part of human nature, religion is a good thing. We can still say religion needs to be uh, dismantled intellectually, um, but also recognize that there will still be problems. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to fix humanity. If people have this ridiculous idea of this... Um, post-religious utopia where religion is gone and everybody's living in harmony. You know, that's an absolute fantasy. Um, but it's at the very least a step in the right direction. You know, we'll never reach utopia, but we can keep walking towards it. And I think that intellectually convincing people that religion is holding us back is a step in that direction. Yeah, I have a 
Um, yeah, sure. You mentioned your three-year-old daughter. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the fact that your uh, father or her grandparents are far enough, but not accepting her. Um, uh, how do you, do you have any plans how to deal with it? Um, because, you know, this maybe you're lucky, um, but there are many families which um, are not lucky enough, they are maybe too close to accept the mutual differences. Okay. Um, yeah, so with my own situation, uh, my, dad, my dad's living in England still, and when he, he, we, I was on speaking terms with him when I first moved to Croatia. And it was actually mostly because I was going to have a daughter that I made the decision to leave Jehovah's Witnesses. Because I thought, I don't want there to be any attempts made to make her a Jehovah's Witness. So I, I drew the line in the sand, and from that point forwards, my father decided to shun not just me and my wife, but also my daughter. He actually did try and say, well, I would come to Croatia to see Jessica so long as you and Diana aren't there. And I, I drew the line there. I said, no, we come as a package, actually. And, uh, and we, we don't want to normalize the behavior of shunning by allowing you to do that. Um, but no, I, I can understand that shunning is a common thing and it's not necessarily exclusive to Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I just feel as though when it comes to children in particular, we can't normalize it. We need them to recognize that this is wrong behavior. You don't control people in that way. Uh, you certainly don't support a, an organization or a religion that, in, that insists that people control others in that way. So my wife and I just try and lead through example as much as we can, but we recognize that it's not exclusive to Jehovah's Witnesses. And in fact, if any of you guys have Netflix, um, there's a documentary called One of Us about Hasidic Jews. It just shows how widespread shunning is and the extent to which people are shunned in religious communities. Any other Okay, hello again. Hello. All right, so in a way you've already touched upon my next question. Um, I often wonder about the psychological need for religion in people, Western people, Eastern people, whoever. So, Lloyd, you mentioned that you had to replace your faith in Christianity with something else and that put you on a search. What I want to know is, you've probably, both of you, had contact with uh, lots of people, right? What works best in bringing over people who are ruling, ruled by irrationality to your side? Because in, I think you have to overcome this irrationality and their need for religion in each and every one of them. So, what works best? What brought most people to at least start thinking differently? Which tactic? In, in my own case, I think I speak so to some degree for, for Alex as well. We're both fans of Christopher Hitchens. And when I was first making my forays into, well, what, what does the other side have to say? What does atheism have to say? I was immersing myself in some of his speeches and some of his debates. And bottom line, what impressed me most was the devotion, the ruthless devotion to logic, to reason. Do, is there a reason for this? Um, Hitchens was very fond of referring to Occam's razor. If we don't need it, we can get rid of it. If we can't prove it, we can get rid of it. And that's a very ruthless thing to do when you're emotionally invested in your beliefs. It, it, it's painful even to do that. But the rewards that you get after you've done it in terms of freeing yourself from all this guilt and this, in my case, dread of being destroyed at Armageddon, um, I cannot recommend it highly enough. And I, I mentioned before about the fact that it's one thing to be an atheist, it's another thing to be a humanist. It's another thing to, to urge people to be kind to each other and to advance humanity. I think you can only encourage people to do that through, uh, through your own example 
and, and let people see the positive effect that that kind of mindset is having on you. The great thing is, I don't need to evangelize this. I can, I can talk about the positive effects, but it's up to anyone. I, I do not lose sleep if someone chooses to be religious. I really do not. I just think that if I'm happy and fulfilled and satisfied having made that leap, then I'm going to talk about it. And, um, and yeah, I, I don't know what you've got to. Well, I, I hate to almost be a bore, but I think it, it goes back again to this idea that there are just certain things that just aren't worth our time. Um, one of the things that people will say um, about atheism is they say, well, where do you get your hope for the afterlife? Something of that sort. And the trick is to, to sort of instill this idea, what if there just is no afterlife? You know, you're asking this question, what am I going to replace this with? Why do you need anything there? Why can't you just live without that? Have you ever considered that the thing that you hold so dearly is not some kind of placeholder that needs to be filled? It's just completely imaginary. You don't need anything to go there. So, of course, some people find it easier to replace religion with certain things. I didn't. I just recognized that it's not a case of what needs to go there instead. It's just a case of there's nothing there. It's an illusion. Let's just get rid of it. Um, I don't know if I'd necessarily take that approach when arguing with somebody because they might not like that. They might think, you know, um, they might think, well, I need something to, to, to put there. They, they might get very upset by the, the uh, proposition that there's just nothing. And, and, and there can be things that fill it, you know, um, like Lloyd was saying before. For me, it just wasn't the case of that. For me, um, it, you, you can recognize, even if you originally replace it, you start by replacing it, over time you can recognize that you don't actually need anything to be there at all. Good. Sure. Be close. Yeah. Two minutes each. Okay, yeah. And works. We'll take one more question. I just wanted to add that one thing we were talking about on the way here was death and the, the fear of death and dealing with mortality. I think that's a, a key thing with religion. I think once you... Part of atheism is, is dealing with that and thinking, how can I, can I live with the fact that I'm not going to live forever? Can I live with the fact that I can't cheat death? And that's a big, big leap that you need to make. And again, it's something that's a very personal journey that people need to make for themselves, but it's, it's well worth making. So one more question. Sure. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Anna, nice to meet you both. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, so <clears throat> my question would be, uh, like we all know that uh, religion, when it came to be, since there is humans, there is some sort of religion, let's put it that way, generally. Uh, but uh, let's say in Christian tradition, 2000 years ago, religion was not just religion as it is today, but it was also science, culture, and religion all in one. So, uh, religion back then, religion now, I think completely different things. My question is, uh, what to do uh, to, to organize a world without this sort of religion? Like, how to do it? Do we just like wait it out and let the people, you know, decide for themselves with all this knowledge that is now available to us, at least in Western worlds and so on? Or do we make some kind of organization, do we do something like that? But then again, there is a fear that it turns out like everybody always says in communism, blah, 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 and so on. And uh, how to deal uh, today with this fact, since uh, there are also legal religious schools and so on. So that's my question, like what to do and how to yeah. get this going on. It's a really good question. It's basically, okay, we, we all more or less agree, but how do we move this forward and, and where do we go with this? Uh, in my own, I can only talk about what's happening with Jehovah's Jehovah's Witnesses and how that kind of serves as like a microcosm of how I see things working for religion in general. And with the ex-Jehovah's Witness movement, what you have is that suddenly there is Google, suddenly there is YouTube, suddenly you, you don't even need to look for this stuff, it's there waiting for you online. If you just type in the wrong keyword or the right keyword, the information is being flung at you. I think that the internet has basically changed everything. It's the reason why Alex and I are here, because of our YouTube channels. And I think that that's one of the most invigorating, exciting, promising things about the atheist movement in general, is that people now have a voice. Anyone in this room can get behind their camera and tell the world about what they think about religion, or what they think about 
fundamentalism or anything that they see as an injustice, they can speak out and that can be projected far and wide. And that's, I, I see the, 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 the reform and the change happening by more and more people doing that. I see it as being a case of the momentum becoming so much. Yeah, it's a case of being a little bit patient. I mean, I think it's fair to say I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to do it. Um, but again, I'm not necessarily here. The, 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 the goal of, of my um, channel, the goal of my writing, of my speaking, isn't necessarily to propose a solution. It's to diagnose the problem. Um, the problem is that a lot of people don't realize there's, there's a problem. Okay? And so what I'm mainly trying to do at the moment is say to people, look, listen, there's something wrong here. We need to restructure the way that we're doing things. We need to get from here to here. How we do that, I don't necessarily know. I mean, I have my ideas, but as far as I'm concerned, what we really need to be doing is letting people know that there is this problem and diagnosing the problem. And once more people know there's a problem, people are talking about it, people much more intelligent than me, people who have a much fuller understanding of, of uh, the politics of the world than I do, are able to come and propose a solution. But that really intelligent person who's going to come along and propose that solution, isn't going to be able to do that if they don't know that there's a problem. And so as far as I'm concerned, my main sort of forte is in diagnosing the problem. Um, I think that it will be a bit of a waiting game. I think it will. But we can lessen the waiting game by talking about it and by not being afraid to criticize bad ideas for the sake of uh, ridiculous retribution that we receive. Um, and so, yeah, the, the thing that we need to do is we need to recognize that if I come out and say that this religion is a bad idea, I'm going to get flat for it. And it's not fun. And it won't be fun for you either. But if all of us come out and say the same thing, well, what are they going to do? You know, and the, in fact, they're going to look at the, the movement that we're making and say, well, maybe there's some credibility to this. So the first thing is, I don't know. If I had to wager a guess, it would be that it will be a bit of a waiting game, but we can lessen that waiting game. Um, by coming to events like this, talking about these kinds of things. And if any of you even have the smallest urge within you to say something, you know, get behind the camera, get in front of an audience, write something down, start a blog, whatever you want to do. Um, everybody who's doing the kind of thing that I'm doing, that I've seen, is incredibly supportive of each other. And we will make your voice heard. And you will get flack for it. But we'll all take the flack together. And if we can sort of spread out enough, give ourselves enough surface area, a tiny little flick isn't going to hurt us. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, but can I just thank all of you for coming, uh, and I'd also like to thank the Hugo's Bar, if we could just express our appreciation for the manager and the staff of the Hugo's Bar, I think we, they deserve a round of applause. And you should, if you're not already members of the Centre for Civil Courage here in Croatia, I would strongly recommend that you sign up. I've recently been accepted as a member. I'm absolutely thrilled. They do fantastic work here in Croatia. So please get behind what they're doing. We need to advance the voice of secularism in this country. It's sorely needed. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for coming. And because Lloyd's probably, I know he's mentioned it, but he's probably too modest to really press in the, the, uh, the book. Um, I don't have a book to sell you, so I'll sell you Lloyd's. It's, it's worth reading. It's a bit of a chunk. Don't feel obliged to read the whole thing, but it's something you can thumb through. It reads really, really well. It's such a fantastic book. You need to read it if you don't know anything about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.